and held by the U.S.-Ukraine Business Council. The U.S.-Ukraine Business Council uh, was organized in 1995 in Washington, D.C. We're now 25 years old this year. For this whole time, we've been a strong voice for international investors and for the international community getting involved in uh, Ukraine. We have a full-time operation, of course, in Washington. We have uh, operations in Kiev. And uh, our first job is to promote Ukraine as a place to do business and then to make it a better place, easier place to do business. USUBC now has over 200 members, including Ukrainian companies. And we are the largest private uh, country-specific trade association in the world that works only for Ukraine. We work on all kinds of issues in the United States and Ukraine. And uh, we particularly work with real companies and real investors who do real things, who put money on the table, who take risk, who create jobs, who uh, work on the bottom line, and uh, who, of course, expect to have earnings. So today, this is our third or fourth panel that we've had with real investors. Real investors don't, don't just do uh, analysis paralysis. They don't just do blah, blah, blah. They have to make real decisions about putting uh, money at risk. They don't engage in platitudes. So we have five companies here, five groups that do real things. They make real investments and they're bottom line people. So that's the kind of people we like. That's the kind of people I think you list, tuned in to listen to. So today, let's first go to John Patton. I met John, I don't know, six, seven, eight years ago. He operates out of London. He's with Argentine Creek Partners. Their office is in New York. They have a wide variety of types of uh, financial instruments and investments they do. John's the one that came up with the title Emerging Market Specialist. That's the first time I kind of heard of that term. So, John, tell us what an emerging market specialist is and tell us uh, kind of what your company does, how long you've been involved in Ukraine, what you're investing in. Uh, then we'll go to the other panelists and get introduced to them. Sure. Perfect. Thanks, Morgan. Um, <clears throat> thanks, everyone, for joining and, and to, to the other panelists. Um, we, Argentum's Creek has been around for about five years. We spun out of Black River, which was uh, owned by Cargill at the time. Uh, so we, um, we are an emerging market specialist investor, which really just means we only invest in emerging markets. Um, I think each market has its own uh, uh, peculiarities, has its own particularities, as it were. And, and uh, we focus on, on investing across emerging markets. And we have offices, as you said, in New York, in London, where I'm based. Uh, we also have an office in Minneapolis, and we have an office in Buenos Aires. So uh, we do invest globally, although we've been very active in Ukraine over the past five years in particular. I myself have been involved in Ukraine really since uh, probably for the last 15 years, um, but uh, and in the, in the wider CIS region for even longer than that. Uh, but we've been active at Argentum. We've been active for the last five years, um, and we've invested in um, really, I'd say, invest in the real sectors of the economy. So by that, I mean metals and mining, agriculture, uh, energy sectors. Uh, and recently, as, as, uh, as you guys put, put out on your, um, to your mailing list, we invested in GN Terminals, which is a, which is a port, uh, which is a terminal in, in, uh, in the port of Odessa. So as you said, we're a special situations investor. I think our panel here is very good because it has different types of investors. We ourselves are a special situations investor, which means we invest in debt. Sometimes it's distressed debt, sometimes it's stressed, sometimes it's uh, simply uh, companies which, uh, which have more complex problems where we can provide a more complex solution to those problems. We also invest at times in private equity, um, and we, we, we really focus on being a partner with strong management teams and, uh, and owners on the ground. That's our preference. Uh, at times, those situations become harder and we have to be more aggressive legally, but we, we really focus on partnering with, with uh, the people we work with uh, on, the, on the ground. Um, so when we get involved in companies, we tend to be an activist investor. So we tend to be, maybe we partner with people. So we're not always the majority, but often we're the majority holder in the, the debt or equity securities. 
uh, and we focus on transparency and improvements, improvements in governance. And as I said, uh, you know, trying to find solutions to often complex problems. Um, and in Ukraine, you know, we've been, we were the largest investor in Maria, which Roman will remember fondly because we worked on that actively together in a, when he was in a different guise than he is today. Um, and we, uh, we've been active in GN terminals. We've been on credit committees. Um, you know, we've been involved in a number of things. So, uh, so that's what we do and what we're about. Um, as an investor in Ukraine, we found the environment to be, um, I think the best part about the environment is there are a number of professional people with whom you can partner and get to the right solutions and the right situation, the right uh, solve their problems effectively that, that arise. At the same time, um, we've we've had a you know over the last five years there have been lots of changes and transitions, which uh, continue today, and and there are still things to do and still improvements to be made. Um, but in general, we we found Ukraine to be a um, an environment where we could get things done when we needed to get them done, and the results have been uh, very positive for us. So uh, that's I think that's probably enough to start with for me, and and we've got other panelists. So I'll I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Morgan. Okay, uh, John, thank you very much. We were very pleased to hear that even in this difficult time, you uh, just recently made a major investment in Ukraine and uh, in a port facility. That sounds uh, that sounds uh, great. And we want to thank you for helping put this panel together. Uh, and uh, we are glad to hear that you say, yeah, there are still companies out there. There are still people out there you can trust and partner with. And there's still uh, potential uh, investment projects there in Ukraine in spite of what's going on. That sounds good. Let's go to Nicholas Temeshuk. Nicholas, I met, I don't know, 12, 13 years ago. I'll never forget him. One day I got a phone call and he said, my name is Nicholas Temeshuk. I represent a major energy company and we want to join the U.S.-Ukraine Business Council. I love calls like that. I didn't know who he was. <laughs> uh, so we got together He's worked for a group of international companies. He's worked out of Brussels. And now he's with an exciting group called You Future. Uh, I like the very positive name. Nicholas, tell us about yourself. Tell us what You Future is. You guys are kind of across the board. Uh, give us your story and, and what you're doing in Ukraine and how you're making a difference there. Hi, Morgan. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for this invitation and for this Kind of intro, indeed. We've known each other for definitely, more, I think, 12 years now, and uh, we've always enjoyed working with you as Ukraine Business Council. First of all, because, as you said, you guys are not about blah, 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 but really about making difference and building a sustainable economic relationship between the U.S. and Ukraine. So your future is a Ukrainian company. It's Ukrainian capital. We are a holding. We've invested over the last 20 years in numerous businesses real estate, renewable energy, infrastructure, IT, uh, industry, pharmaceuticals. And currently, we're not big by the international standards. Our current assets, our management are evaluated at around 500 million. And the total market cap of the companies we've invested in is above 1 billion. So it's not big by any international standards, especially in the age when money is being printed like paper, but by the Ukrainian standard, it's, uh, it's sizable, and we're, uh, we are present mostly in the real assets. We own one of the biggest uh, developers uh, in Kiev uh, called UDP. We've built over 3 million square meters of property in Kiev, residential, commercial, industrial. We also own a company, UDP Renewables, uh, which we started just three years ago, and already have built more than 150 megawatt in solar photovoltaic stations and we're stretching into wind now, having a pipeline of wind projects for 300 megawatt at least for the next three years. We own company Biopharma, which is a remarkable company and a producer of blood plasma derived medicines. As you know, blood plasma derived um, medicine producers today in the world form an alliance and they are working on a immunoglobulin to fight COVID-19. We are in that international alliance also working on that. Uh, we, over the last years, our flagship projects were innovation parks in Ukraine, which are remarkable um, uh, merging of uh, real estate and tech. And we are building such innovation park unit city in Kyiv, but also in Lviv and in Kharkiv. We recently stretched into IT business and here we have a dual expertise of M&A 
and IT outsourcing. We buying and merging companies uh, and also do it as a side, uh, side activity, uh, participating or consulting or enabling M&A for other investors willing to invest in IT in Ukraine. And of course, we develop uh, industrial parks with first industrial park that we opened several years ago in Bila Terqua. There we invest ourselves in manufacturing facilities. And uh, we also provide platform uh, industrial, exceptional industrial land plots for all manufacturers, local or international, who want to create added value in Ukraine. In general, I think that being Ukrainian, I've worked all around the world and lived in many different countries. And uh, as Morgan mentioned, worked uh, for a number of uh, renowned international companies. I think that the biggest challenge and opportunity that Ukraine presents today is that it ha it's one of the last very few, I would say, underdeveloped markets in the region. And uh, if you are seeking niches, that are waiting to be developed and you're seeking double digit returns, you got to go to Ukraine. And for us Ukrainians, it's very important to support any business, any initiative, any investment that targets increasing productivity because increasing productivity across all sectors, across all spheres of business and life is our key strategic task. And that's what you future invests in. We invest in increasing productivity in Ukraine. If it's IT, if it's innovation park, if it's new age real estate, pharmaceuticals or renewable energy, we're focused on increasing productivity in Ukraine. And we have been able to attract a lot of international investors uh, within our project, like with re renewable energy, we attracted Axiona, one of the biggest majors in renewable energy in the world. Uh, for our innovation park unit city, we just recently received a loan from European Investment Bank. And uh, we are working on several more deals even this year, despite everything that we're hoping to announce soon. So I'm very excited to see international companies, international investors believing in Ukraine, investing in Ukraine. And uh, even uh, beyond this panel, guys, uh, I would love to meet you all in person and see if there are any opportunities in business we could explore together. So thank you for this point of panel once again, Morgan, and everyone. Hey, Nicholas, thank you, Lou. Grace, this is an amazing portfolio you have in a very broad sector. So it looks like you're very open to uh, what uh, various uh, areas and uh, looking for partners in those areas. And uh, uh, sounds great. Um, we always like to say that uh, the number one priority for Ukraine is economic development. Number two is economic development. Number three is economic development. We just wish uh, more politicians and others in Ukraine would understand that. And we always say the best defense against uh, Ukraine's eastern neighbor is a strong growing economy. And the best way to keep the EU and the United States involved is to have a strong growing economy with lots of reforms. So to Absolutely. me and, and to all of you, it's a no brainer that we got to have the major focus on economic development, investments, both domestic and international, and creating jobs and making Ukraine stronger uh, in terms of its economic development. When I talked to John and I said, who would be a good person to be on the panel? He said, hey, I know a top expert. That's Dennis Fulling, Medici Capital. So I said, hey, that sounds good upon your recommendation. Uh, let's go for it. So we got a hold of Dennis. Dennis agreed. Dennis operates out of London. So Dennis, tell us a little about yourself, Da Vinci Capital, how long you've been involved in Ukraine and what you guys are interested in and doing in Ukraine now. So let's turn it over to Dennis. It's all yours. Morgan, thank you very much. And John, thanks for setting such high expectations of me. Um, but I'm pleased to, um, pleased to be here and uh, discuss Ukraine and the opportunities. So as Morgan mentioned, I'm a um, managing partner at Vinci Capital. We are a private equity firm. We've been active in the CIS region for over 12 years. Um, before that, I was also in the region in investment banking with Renaissance Capital, uh, where we were also quite active in Ukraine, both in um, um, capital markets as well as consumer credit. Um, we manage about $500 million. Most of our uh, investors um, are large, Institutional fund of funds and DFIs. So we have EBRDs. We work closely with Andre and his team as a core investor in our most recent fund. 
Um, we have investors, um, um, large US funded funds like Harborvest and Adam Street. Um, we're currently um, uh, managing our second fund. It's fully invested. Um, we have a number of interesting portfolio companies that are active in Ukraine. We own a company called Data Arts that's based in New York. But they have over 3,000 developers globally, of which 60% are in Ukraine, about 1,600 developers in six different cities in Ukraine. Uh, quite an interesting company providing very complex software solutions to their corporate clients, uh, of which most are in Europe and the US. Um, we also own a large uh, software distribution business that generates about $20 million of sales in Ukraine. Uh, and we are targeting a few other companies right now, one in the advertising technology space where they develop AI solutions out of Dniepro and sell those to large Western companies uh, in the US and, and in Europe. Um, so we're, we're building a new fund. It's a $300 million fund. We intend to deploy about a third of that in Ukraine over the next three to five years. Um, we're quite bullish on the market. Um, we think there's a tremendous talent pool. Uh, most of our uh, strategy uh, involves technology investments, but we define that quite broadly. We're not just referring to software companies, but any technology uh, um, whereby companies are improving their supply chain. So for example, if, an ag if it's an agricultural company in Ukraine and we would provide growth equity to improve their automation, we would consider that um, technology investment and therefore would satisfy the investment criteria of our new fund. Um, our new funds being backed by DEG, a large German uh, developmental financial institution, um, as well as a number of other uh, investors who are quite active in the region. Um, we have offices uh, in London. We're also quite active in Kazakhstan. We have an office in Nur Sultan and we intend to deploy um, uh, private equity capital and growth, growth capital into, into Kazakhstan as well. So, so we like the CIS region. This particular fund excludes Russia. Uh, so it's only, it's only CIS excluding Russia. Um, and we, um, you know, our, our, our kind of strategy is to look at, typically we're the first institutional investor going into companies, providing growth equity, aligning with entrepreneurs. Um, most of our investments uh, are new capital as opposed to um, a secondary uh, capital transactions. And, and, and that money gets deployed, for example, into, um, into Ukraine. One of, one of our strategies together with our investors is to really help um, create and keep high paying jobs in the countries where we operate. So for example, technology um, you know, development in Ukraine, as we all know, is very, very strong. Um, the skill sets are very, very, very strong. And um, uh, one of our goals is to continue to develop and invest into that area uh, to ensure high paying jobs remain in the market. Um, we do like to develop our companies and internationalize them uh, through M&A. We get quite actively involved in corporate governance. We take board positions, uh, but we also help to drive top line with our portfolio companies and look for uh, growth opportunities um, through, through additional relationships and different uh, revenue opportunities. Um, usually our exits are through the capital markets. Um, we were early investors in EPAM, which is now a $12 billion company traded on the, on the New York Stock Exchange. They're a large software developer with also exposure in, in Ukraine. Um, but we also look for strategic exits and private exits as well. So um, we're quite excited about um, doing more business in Ukraine. We probably have um, five to 10 targets that we're looking at quite closely right now two of which will close in the next um, three to four months. So um, I'm looking forward to, you know, looking forward to further development. And, and I think that's, uh, I think that's uh, covers, covers most of what we're looking at now. So thank you, Morgan. And thanks for uh, involving me in this, in this webinar. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that story about Arcady Dobkin and, and uh, Ipam is an amazing yeah. story. Great story. Yeah. 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 A uh, guy comes from Mold comes from Belarus to the United States, starts this company, and uh, man, it's uh, it's an amazing success story. Uh, Great story. Great story. Yeah, largest software developer <coughs> um, outside of India. They have twenty eight thousand developers today. So, quite an amazing we story. Met. We were first early early investors in two thousand and seven, two thousand and eight. So yeah, we met uh, Arcady a lot long time ago they've been long time members of ours he's come yeah. to our meeting he's in washington he was at our meeting uh 
last September with uh, President Zelensky. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, just an amazing success story of what he's uh, been able to do with that. Uh, and uh, the various investors that have taken a risk there, and it's proved to be very successful them. Another person, John, said uh, it would be good to be on this uh, webinar is this Roman Nikitov from uh, uh, ICU Investors. And uh, Roman is located in Kiev. And uh, I uh, first met him, I think, in 2008. Uh, he's been with various financial institutions. So, Roman, uh, I don't think a lot of people know about ICU Ventures. So you're right there on the ground in Kiev. Tell us uh, about uh, IC Ventures, your involvement in Ukraine, and what you're doing uh, to find uh, good companies to work with in Ukraine. You know, Morgan, I think there's a technical issue. It seems like Roman just dropped off. I'm sure it's a mistake. I'm sure he'll be back. But can you? Can we come back? To, that's a good intro. But can we come back to him because I think he's just uh, he's just falling off the thing. Okay, sure. He will. Uh, he will join. He will join in a minute. Yeah, I think something happened there. So. <clears throat> you want? Do you want to shift over to Andre for a minute? Then we'll come back to Roman. Sure. Sure. Of course, all of you know that the largest uh, investor in Ukraine is EBRD. They have a very broad portfolio. They can work with cities. They can work with uh, uh, rayons. They can work with private business. They can work with the government. And they're doing all kinds of amazing things out there. Almost every uh, week or two, they announce another project for Ukraine. Uh, Andre Gosik is the principal for private equity. We had a webinar recently just with EBRD where they explained their uh, their broad program and all the major things they can do and their total commitment to Ukraine. So Andre, uh, glad to have you on the panel. Uh, tell us a little about uh, uh, EBRD's work in, in private equity or any of these other uh, markets uh, that you guys work in. Yeah, thank you very much Morgan for this intro. And uh, good morning, everyone. Maybe just a brief, um, uh, a couple of words very brief about uh, who you are, although I'm sure most of you already know about us, but we are a AAA rated institution owned by 69 countries, uh, the EU and the European Investment Bank. We are operating in uh, 38 countries. Uh, we are mostly known as debt provider in the region, but uh, we also do a lot in equity. Uh, we've been in Ukraine uh, since 1992, uh, meaning that we are probably one of the uh, longest standing investors here. We've been through various political cycles, uh, through various times, and uh, we, we keep believing in this country, and uh, we are working toward the helping the Ukrainian economy uh, grow further. Uh, so our portfolio... Uh, our total investments into the country are around 15 billion euros. That includes both debt and equity. Our equity portfolio uh, currently is uh, over uh, 320 million euro. In total, we invested, uh, I believe, uh, almost 1 billion into equity in Ukraine. Uh, so. Yeah, I think it won't be exaggeration to say that we are the biggest uh, investor in the country and one of the uh, longest standing. Uh, what uh, sort of products uh, can we do? Uh, well, we can invest into private equity directly. We can also invest into PE funds that operate uh, in the country uh, as an LP, as a limited partner. And we also do venture capital financing as well. Uh, in terms of our private equity portfolio, I can just give you a couple of highlights uh, uh, on the type of uh, companies or partners uh, that we are looking for. Uh, currently, we are an investor in the largest uh, uh, petrol uh, retail station network called the OCO, or Gal Naftagaz. Uh, so we've been with the company since uh, 2009, uh, which gives an idea about uh, uh, our holding period. We can uh, we, we can actually stay uh, as equity partner for uh, 
example, longer than a typical private equity fund. Uh, we can also partner with the strategics in our P investments. For instance, uh, we are a large uh, minority investor in the uh, Rafazan Bank Aval, one of Ukraine's largest commercial banks, uh, owned uh, majority owned by the Austrian Rafazan. Uh, so that, that, that sort of partnerships uh, uh, we feel very comfortable with, and uh, basically uh, that's. Uh, we are, I would say, we are the kind of partners that uh, lots of strategics who want to come to Ukraine for the first time uh, are looking for. In terms of products, we can also do uh, quasi-equity products, mass type products. For instance, uh, we were holders of a mezzanine uh, in the company called the Ergo, Ergo Park. Uh, that's uh, number two producer of household goods in Ukraine. Uh, that was a couple of years ago acquired by a Greek uh, company called Sorantis. Uh, so we are happy to help Ukrainian companies uh, find uh, strategic buyers uh, in a way. Uh, and in terms of our involvement, uh, we obviously, we, as a development bank, uh, we provide the growth capital primarily. Uh, we are looking for transition impact. Uh, and uh, our key feature is we are helping companies uh, build the uh, uh, best of the class uh, corporate governance, uh, and uh, we partner with the transparent companies with the quality management and the vision, visionary owners. So that that's in a nutshell. And uh, thank right. you, Morgan, for having me here. Hey, thank you for God, you guys, all your great work. It's always. Uh... Wonderful to see another press release from uh, EBRD about uh, a program that you're supporting uh, in Ukraine. And also we've had a, a webinar this year with IFC and they've become more aggressive in Ukraine and that's good. So between EBRD and IFC and hopefully more from USXM and US Development Corporation and the European Development Corporation, uh, and all the private companies, uh, we can make more investments available. Did uh, did Roman uh, is Roman back on? Yes, I'm here, Morgan. Oh, there he Everything is. Everything is cool. Yes, I'm back. Okay, good, Roman. Uh, yeah, J John recommended you, uh, so that was good. And uh, not too many people know about ICU Ventures, but I know you're on the ground there in Kiev, and. Uh, I mentioned about 2008 and you've been involved in various financial institutions and a financial expert. So tell us a little about what you're doing, what ICU Ventures is and what you're looking for there in, uh, in Ukraine. Well, yes, uh, Morgan, John, thank you very much for organizing this event. Uh, this is hilarious to, to be able to speak uh, uh, to, to, to you guys uh, uh, online. This is a new world. Well, ICU Ventures uh, actually is part, uh, it's a venture capital arm of uh, ICU group. ICU initially stood for Investment Capital Ukraine. So it tells you a lot about our focus. Uh, it was founded back in 2006 by investment professionals coming from ING Bank. So we're all bankers that uh, had an idea of creating this Goldman Sachs of Ukraine back uh, there. And uh, uh, the ambition drove us into, uh, into basically what is today a multi-strategy asset management firm, focusing on liquid stories, uh, investing into being active into uh, corporate debt and sovereign debt. We're, um, we're one of the biggest pension fund owners, private pension fund owners now in, uh, in the Ukraine. Uh, we, we have something like 30% of the market share in the local secondary uh, trading of the local bonds, which is very attractive, which proved to be very attractive uh, to the foreign investors um, as well. Even after rundown of the COVID, it still stands at about $3 billion <clears throat> of foreigners investing in, into this class of assets. We also operate, um, we also have a banking operation in Ukraine. We have, uh, we have a private equity team. We have been investing in distress that I've been personally involved in, in, uh, in, this, in this market prior to, to heading uh, ICU Ventures. That's where we actually you know, got, to know, got to know each other uh, much better than we did before with John. 
Um, so we've cooperated and we competed, you know, it was all of that. Um, and uh, today, about two years ago, we have uh, looked at the market uh, again, once again, and decided that there is a new wave coming um, for for Ukrainian develop for Ukrainian investor and uh, those investors that are looking into Ukraine, and this is part of uh, what some uh, some of them call a fourth industrial revolution, where Ukraine uh, has uh, seems to have quite the benefit of uh, of a legacy of uh, engineering uh, tradition and uh, and the talent. Uh, which uh, has resulted into uh, first as a first wave resulted into um, and into out companies that outsource um, Ukrainian skilled labor um, to to bigger names of the world. And then uh, at the time when we saw that more and more product companies started appearing, we started focusing on that market and have made already in, uh, uh, in and have made already ten uh, investments. Uh, most of them uh, are uh, in Ukraine or related to Ukraine. Uh, we try to keep uh, about 70% of our portfolio actually being relevant to Ukraine. Uh, and uh, so we invest uh, uh, anything from 250 to a million dollars into one story uh, at uh, late seed or uh, round eight. So happy to take it forward today with any angle uh, that you, uh, Morgan, would drive us into discussing. And thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Roman. Sounds very interesting. And uh, one thing we always know, and one reason we like to have these, is because uh, good news and uh, finding good partners and reliable partners. And many of you, of course, are uh, you're it's part of a three-part chain. You have various investors around the world and institutional investors that that make funds available to you guys. And then your job is to find the right people in Ukraine to invest. And so you're, you're pulling uh, various partners together. And there's always more than one uh, partner in all these deals, including then, of course, uh, some kind of a due diligence firm and a law firm and a banker and uh, investors. And uh, so it's a, it's a process of putting various partners together and, and make it, making it work. John, when you uh, you've been involved in the agriculture quite a bit, and I know when you made that latest investment, you added two uh, top agricultural experts in Ukraine uh, to your program, and Bogdan Chomiak, and uh, who I've known for I don't know maybe thirty years, and then Alexei Pavlenko, uh, who we worked with when he was uh, Minister of Agriculture. Uh, so it seems like you're uh, kind of setting up a longer run strategy for agribusiness, which now they say will be the largest industry in Ukraine. And it's been moving ahead with uh, during this time. Uh, so you, uh, John, are you looking at everything from production to consumption or just uh, uh, when, when food has to be processed and uh, wholesaling, retailing, uh, distributing, uh, exporting, uh, What's the broad area of agribusiness? Because and why did you bring on two more agricultural experts if you're not going to want to focus more in this area? Well, I'll tell you what, I think what I said uh, in my intro remarks is true. And in Ukraine, there's some very good people that you can partner with. And, uh, and in fact, Alexei Pavlenko, for example, was the chairman for us at Maria when we were working very hard together with Roman on uh, pulling that story together and, and then ultimately uh, uh, after it defaulted, selling it, uh, cleaning it up, and selling it to the Saudis. So, you know, it's very much the case that Bogdan and uh, and and Alexei for us are agricultural experts. But I would say, in other things we've invested in, we've also found very good experts to work with. So it just happens to be that um, you know, GN Terminals is a business that's focused on agri, and it's it's true that it's a very important sector for Ukraine, and therefore we see lots of opportunities there, and we continue to look at deals. But I, I think for we're a generalist investor, so we do we are open to other things, and we have invested in metals and mining, which is also a very important sector for Ukraine. Uh, we've invested in infrastructure. Uh, we've looked at transport. Uh, we've we've looked at a number of occasions at, at various energy projects, and I'm sure that there will be a time when we invest in energy as well. So, um, you know, I think uh, I think Ukraine has, as I as I believe I, one of you, maybe several of you said, Ukraine has. 
uh, already an industrialized economy in many respects. And and there are there are some very high quality people who are running and owning companies. And we've uh, had the had the the success of being able to find good partners and and been able to work with them. So it's definitely true that agriculture is very important to Ukraine. And and we. Um, we, I would say, are probably focused more at the moment on the logistics side of it than the than the than the production side. But at the same time, we're open to opportunities, and, and we'll see what uh, what comes as as the as the world unfolds from here. Okay. Sometimes uh, companies tell us, uh, "How do we find the the people with money? How do we find the people that are interested in investing?" And so uh, I know Nicholas is there, right there in Kiev, and and uh, lots of people know him and his company, and Roman's in Kiev, and Andre's in Kiev. But what about you two guys in London? Do you have anybody that represents you in Kiev or people wanting to get in touch with you? Uh, they just go to your website, or how, to, how do they uh, find you guys? Well, you can always find us from, uh, from being in London, Morgan. So you know how to find me if, if you need it. And, and frankly, we have, uh, we, the great thing about Ukraine is we have a range of partners on the ground that we work with. So, and, and often we communicate on a regular basis with Dennis, for example, on different opportunities. So, and, and, you know, at times with Roman, although I'm not investing uh, so much in the kind of companies that Roman's investing in now, we've had many years of, of, of coordination with Andrea, I met recently uh, both in London and, and in Kiev. So, Nicholas, you and I have a chance to meet, I'm sure, in the future. But in terms of finding us and, and uh, big, being able to get in touch, I think we're pr pretty easy to find. And, uh, and I'm always happy to take a call from you. Okay, well, that sounds good. Uh, Dennis, uh, how, do we, how do investors find you? Just yeah, and, um, you know, similar, similar to what some of John's comments, we do have, you know, we do have people on the ground in Kiev. We're going to expand our office there. Um, because we're managing portfolio companies in Ukraine, we're there often. We're quite active there. Um, as I mentioned, we own uh, uh, several companies in Ukraine. Um, so our intention is to increase our presence, um, um, you know, in, in, in Kiev. Um, our, our fund, as mentioned, is based out of London, but we're, we travel often. Um, and, you know, I think having partners on the ground, having portfolio companies on the ground, obviously helps build your presence there. But we do intend to um, to hire more and increase our presence in, in Kiev as we move more towards um, our, our new fund that I mentioned earlier. Okay, sounds good. Uh, Nicholas, tell us a little more about the ph pharmaceutical industry in, in Ukraine. Uh, there are some international investors there. We know there's been a lot of problems with uh, unfair tenders uh, involving in Indian companies and Chinese companies. Uh, uh, how do you see the local development of pharmaceuticals in, in Ukraine uh, uh, going down the road? So, first of all, I'm definitely not an expert in the pharmaceutical business, to be honest. Uh, okay. My, my, my expertise in pharmaceuticals is really limited to our portfolio company, Biopharma, which also operates in a quite niche market, I would say, because blood plasma derived medicine is a very niche market globally, as well as in Ukraine, but it's a unique market. So um, uh, until last year, our, our company Biopharma comprised of two pillars of generic drugs and blood plasma derived medicines. And last year we made exit from the generic drugs division. We sold it to German Stata. If I'm not mistaken, it was the second exit uh, during the entire history of independence of Ukraine in pharmaceutical to an international investor. So that was a remarkable event, I think. And we fully concentrated now on blood plasma derived medicines. Uh, it's a quite unique technology. I think a handful of companies globally know how to do it. Uh, the market is owned predominantly by American and uh, European companies. Uh, but the thing is, uh, because of the extremely expensive insurance-based healthcare in the U.S. and in Europe, those companies have really fenced themselves out uh, from the external competition by really raising not just the standards, but also the costs of sourcing blood plasma and processing and the cost of these products to an extent where those companies cannot supply the developing world which is the most of the world. And this is exactly where the unique niche lies for us. 
We are already exporting to almost 40 countries globally. And last uh, fall, last year, uh, almost simultaneously with selling our generic business to Shtara, we opened a brand new state-of-the-art facility in Bila Tsarkva, which is a new plant uh, for processing plasma with a capacity up to a million liters per year. And with this plant alone, we can triple our current production. And we are uh, supplying all over the world, the entire CIS, Southeast Asia, Middle East, Africa, Latin America, all countries that A, do not have their own processing capacity. They do not have uh, domestic supplies of blood plasma derived medicines. B, uh, American and European drugs are very expensive for them. C, American European companies don't give a darn about those countries because growing uh, on their domestic markets of Western Europe and uh, North America is absolutely enough for them to be successful, to be profitable, and they're not even meeting their uh, core market demand. So they're not looking seriously at the emerging market. And this is where our blue ocean lies, I believe. And with this new plant and with higher demand for blood plasma derived medicines, I think across our portfolio, biopharma, according to our current estimates, will be our first unicorn. And, uh, and we, in, in biopharma until last year, we had uh, also partners from private equity, Horizon Capital, were our partners, uh, also Dutch development financial institution, FMO, but they exited now uh, when we sold our uh, generic business to Stara. So it, it's an amazing business and uh, we believe in it. Uh, that's as, as much as I can tell you about the pharmaceutical side of, of our portfolio. I know that there have been always questions uh, uh, when it comes to tenders and uh, when it comes to uh, public procurement in Ukraine. But I think you agree that over the last six years, it had improved significantly. It is far from being perfect whatsoever, but it has improved significantly. We also feel it. Uh, we feel less pressure, we feel more adequacy and uh, level playing field, even though, being honest with you guys, I am completely against level playing field in Ukraine. I am for, totally uh, for uh, this field to be tilted towards those investors that create added value in Ukraine. Those investors, be it national or international, who create added value in Ukraine must have uh, long-term preferences to develop the Ukrainian economy because honestly speaking, when you have negative or zero interest rates for the two biggest currencies in the world, it's almost impossible to imagine how a Ukrainian entrepreneur can possibly compete with the cost of capital available in Ukraine against that international capital available to um, develop markets in the world, which on the one hand gives international private equity like you guys great opportunities to invest in Ukraine and make extra profit. Uh, but uh, I think that when it comes to Ukrainian capital and Ukrainian business, or not just Ukrainian, but anyone doing business in Ukraine, creating any value in Ukraine, I think we need this level playing field tilted towards us a big time, at least for the next five, seven years. Uh, thank you very much, Nicholas. Dennis, you told us about a company you're involved with that has several thousand people working in Ukraine. Tell us a little more about that company and, and uh, their work. And uh, their, I assume they're doing a lot of exporting of technology. Uh, Dennis, how about that major investment you told me about? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Morgan. Yeah, um, as I mentioned, the company is called Datar. Um, it is, I would say, somewhat analogous to EPAM. It's a software solutions business um, with over half of its development capacity in Ukraine in six different cities. Um, so what was their name not, again? The name of that company? The name of the company is called Data Art. Data Art. Um, okay. Right. And they, um, you know, they're 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 um, developing really complex software solutions for their corporate clients in Europe and in the U.S. I would say sixty to sixty-five percent of the revenues in the U.S. with the balance in Western Europe, but all their delivery capacity and their technical expertise and engineering skills are in Ukraine and other, other CIS countries. Um, they deliver to about 40% of their, their revenues into the financial services sector. So they build very complex solutions for 
for companies like NASDAQ, like Moody's. Um, um, and so they don't, they don't build their own software product, but they deliver solutions for their corporate clients. So we intend to invest actually even more into this company. Our goal is to do a, um, a consolidation in the space and look for other m and targets, including other uh, software development businesses in Ukraine, uh, potentially Belarus, um, look to grow their revenue uh, um, over the next couple of years and look to do, similar to what we did with EPAM, an exit in the, in the capital markets, most likely in the US. So really, really good company, you know, building and providing really strong jobs in Ukraine, uh, very strong culture, uh, corporate culture in Ukraine. And they and they um, their their view is to is is to even you know increase their delivery capacity in Ukraine over the next couple of years. So about how long have you been involved with them? Two years. Um, Two. We were looking to kind of replicate the EPAM investment thesis after we exited slightly after the IPO, and we scoured the market for many many years, almost two years until we found uh, Datar and we invested together with a few co investors. Um, about two years ago, um, uh -huh. so DEG you know, I mentioned earlier is a, a, a co-investor in, into the same company, um, and, and and we do that quite often. And John kind of alluded to the fact that, you know, we we like to build co-investment clubs and syndicates, and our investment size tickets are usually ten to twenty million, but we what we like to do is build a much larger consortium of investors. Uh, many of our LPs take up their co-investment rights um, and take larger positions in companies, but Da Vinci would lead and execute the deal and manage the portfolio company, but we bring in others uh, alongside us um, to do larger transactions. Sounds good. When Russia shut off all the exports, Ukraine had to make some major adjustments and increasing exports of goods and services is still a top priority for Ukraine uh, to get hard currency uh, into Ukraine, have earnings, have things that you can sell quickly like agricultural products. So I think all of you, from what you've said, you're involved in uh, export industries and you're trying to work with those who uh, have international clients that they can sell to. Any comments from any of, any of you about uh, the old export industry from Ukraine and how to increase that and get more exports, more international clients, more hard currency coming into Ukraine? Any comments from any of you about exports? Well, I can say something. Uh, the only, well, I'm again, not an expert in this field, but just recently uh, I've attended a big event, Grain Ukraine in Odessa, organized by Andrei Stavnitzer, a, a Ukrainian entrepreneur. It was a fantastic event, but very high level, good discussions, very professional. But what I was frustrated with is that absolutely none of the major agriculture industry players announced about their plans to invest more in processing in Ukraine. They all promised to invest in logistics. They all promised to invest in all kinds of export uh, facilitation. They all promised to invest in productivity for Hector uh, and spoke about the role of Black Sea region in, uh, grains in the world, which have grew from 2% to 80% of the last 20 years, which is remarkable, of course, but none of it really was about creating this added value in Ukraine. And I get it, it's business. And uh, you do it actually for two reasons. A, because you have a huge market, which Ukraine is not, there is no huge domestic consumption market for those processed products. Or if you have uh, unique conditions, geographical or tariff wise to export it to uh, adjacent markets, which we also don't because with all the benefits the EU-Ukraine agreement has brought, undoubtedly, particularly in agri products, we are squeezed and stifled to almost nothing. Those quotas are completely making uh, exports of those ready products to the EU uncompetitive. And it leaves us with one and only solution unless there are preferences, uh, tax, uh, legislative, other preferences to the Ukrainian producers, there will be no investment in uh, added value uh, manufacturing of product 
from agriculture commodities or other raw materials in Ukraine significantly. So it's really a government job. And I don't think that a lot of international partners, our international partners or um, investors necessarily like it uh, because most of them would like to source raw materials, grains and grains from Ukraine. But this is something that our governments need to do or there will be no major investment in processing in Ukraine. Oh, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's good to know when uh, industries are changing and with steel and other products being the major exporters, it's great to know that agriculture and IT probably are now the two largest exporters of, of goods and services from Ukraine. And many people say that uh, the capacity of ex ag exports and IT could double in the next few years. So that's an amazing uh, Amazing area. Any comments from any of you about some of the recent changes around uh, the National Bank of Ukraine and uh, your interest in stability, your interest in uh, uh, the whole macroeconomic scene? Anybody make any comments about that? I think it kind of it's it's sort of goes to Nicholas's point about people holding back on some of their investments. Actually, I, I suspect. Um, uh, because, you know, I think the changes to the government and the COVID crisis, which, of course, Ukraine had nothing to do with, but still it affects everyone, plus the change to the uh, to the NBU, which was a surprise. I mean, of course, maybe the new governor of the NBU will be fine. We don't know. And he seems to be qualified. And so <clears throat> I think we should <clears throat> probably reserve judgment. But uh, at the same time, uh, take, undertaking significant changes in the midst of all this uncertainty creates, I think, an environment where some of these same investors that Nicholas was referring to and others probably put on hold their decisions until they see that there is stability. And, you know, stability of the Grivna and stability of the central bank and its independence has been one of the cornerstones of the last five years, which many in the investment community have really taken some strength from and some, some uh, I think, positive uh, views of. So from my own perspective, I think you know, of course, we we uh, we hope that the new governor is is uh, also supportive, as he has said he is, of independence, and we hope that that continues. There are certainly a lot of forces that would like to undermine the NBU, um, and I and I think for us, it's it's a uh, it's one of the institutions that represents uh, is a clear lightning rod for foreign investors and represents because of their stability and their consistency, they've really represented, I think, some of the best of the last reforms of the last five years. So we certainly hope that continues. Um, but I, you know, I, I think uh, just to echo Nicholas's comments a bit on, on the processing, there's a lot of sectors where investments can be made in Ukraine. Of course, that's true. But while, while I agree that the European uh, free trade agreement hasn't given a lot of opportunity yet to the, to the agri sector because there's a lot of limitations on it, at the same time, the Middle East is a is a, a part of the world which is wide open. It seems like for Ukrainian exports, so there is a lot of opportunity for Ukraine. And I and I suspect, and of course I, I I don't know this for sure, but I suspect that Middle Eastern investors would consider more investments in Ukraine the more sense they had of stability, and the more sense to to uh, Nicholas's point they had a sense of some preferential treatment as investors. So I, I certainly echo your comments, Nicholas, and think that's a good idea as well. So. Well, we know that many of you, uh, including EBRD and all the business associations and, and the United States, everybody stepped in to try to encourage the government to solve this conflict they had with renewable energy, uh, which went on for four or five months and, of course, was not good for those who had invested based on a, an agreement with the government and uh, hadn't been getting paid. So the battles continue. Uh, for reform, the battles continue to have a stable environment there in which to work. So we appreciate uh, all those companies, investors, and uh, international that are willing to step up and be counted and speak out uh, in favor of good reforms and in favor of uh, good policies and resolving problems and not changing all the rules. Uh, my Colleague Michael Dunsenko has been monitoring some questions for the panel. Uh, Michael, any uh, uh, questions have come in for the panel? Oh, wait, just a minute before we go to that. Does any of the rest of you want to comment about uh, this macro stability issue in the National Bank uh, value of the agreement? Anyone have jump in on that before we go to questions? Yeah, Morgan, I would like short to comments uh, to give short 
comments on national bank and on renewable energy, because as I uh, mentioned earlier, we are investors in renewable energy. The national bank in general, since 2014, have done a remarkable job at stabilizing the Ukrainian financial system, cleaning out the banking market, and they have truly done a tremendous job. And uh, I think that all of us businesses and Ukrainians appreciated it, especially during the last several months of the global COVID pandemic, where effectively we didn't have any emergency when it comes to currency and fiscal situation in Ukraine. And that is predominantly an achievement of the National Bank. And uh, we are all watching it carefully because it must remain independent and adequate. That said, we must find a way r respecting our commitments and our uh, programs with IMF and other international sponsors and donors to support the Ukrainian economy, Ukrainian businesses in particular, with the local uh, lending mechanisms. Because with all the uh, caution and uh, uh, inflation targeting that uh, uh, NBU has been predominantly concerned with, we haven't invented over the last six years any sensible working mechanism on how to provide accessible capital to Ukrainian business. And this is absolutely not acceptable situation if you really want to have your priorities of Ukraine economic development, Ukraine economic development, and Ukraine economic development. And second about renewable energy, you're absolutely right. I think that I do get the situation when the government needs to manage the budget deficit, but this is not about expensive renewable energy or any other cheap source of energy. And I come from energy business. This is where I do specialize in. And it is about subsidies in Ukraine. As long as there will be subsidized uh, parts of the society and especially uh, uh, communal enterprises and state enterprises and other entities that will be subsidized uh, through the energy prices. There will be always a disbalance with or without renewable energy. And breaching contracts like that is absolutely not a way out. And I think that even with this memorandum that they have signed an amendment to the law that they've made, I think Ukraine is looking at a number of international litigations that it will lose, doubtlessly. Other European countries uh, went up that route and they ended up losing in arbitration to international investors. We still believe in the sector, we're still investing. As I said, we have a pipeline of ready to build projects for 300 megawatt in wind uh, and uh, hopefully even more. It's a very dynamic and interesting business, but I hope that they do not, that they stop messing out with it um, in the future. Thank you. Okay, any comments from Dennis and Moment or Andre in this area before we move to questions? No, no comments from me, Mark. I can only subscribe to what has already been mentioned by the colleagues. Uh, I must add that we as uh, the BRD uh, are involved in uh, all the relevant policy dialogues uh, with the Ukrainian governmental bodies uh, up to the president. Uh, so we are working uh, hard on the resolution uh, of this situation with the renewables. We are also sort of uh, reflecting uh, upon uh, the, the opinion of the investment community with regard to uh, how important uh, the independence of the central bank is. Uh, so we, we are, I think we are on the same page in terms of those two big topics. Uh, uh, let's hope that uh, our like decision makers will, will make right decisions. Okay, thank you very much. Michael Dotsenko, how about some questions? You're on mute, Michael. Uh, we had five questions which were answered online by uh, some of the people. I don't know if uh, Nicholas uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Patton, uh, if you guys want to repeat. Uh, uh, the thing is, we do have some people watching us over YouTube and Facebook, so not everybody has seen your answers uh, to, to these questions. Um, for example, there was one to Nicholas about uh, possibly having a technology park in Dnipro. 
Yeah, well, okay, I'll, I'll read out just the answer. So your future doesn't have yet innovation parks in Dnipro. We have the biggest one, Unit City, the 25 hectares, almost a million square meters in Kiev uh, that we're developing. We have one in Lviv and Kharkiv. Uh, no plans for Dnipro for the time being. Then I had a question about how we improve productivity. Well, we invest in our companies always in cutting edge equipment and training. Separately, we invest heavily in education and across our portfolio, we've introduced lead management system across all of the companies. So in real estate, for instance, and innovation parks, all the new commercial real estate buildings we're putting up are uh, built according to American lead standards. So there's that. Um, what was what else? The question was where Bia Pharma source sources plasma. This is Ukraine and the world, depending on the market situation. Yeah, and uh, yeah, there was a comment about so the comment that working mechanism to provide capital lending is to fix courts. Yes, fix courts would significantly improve the entire situation in Ukraine, undoubtedly. But this is not a panacea for accessible capital because until NBU rate is always by times higher than the inflation, always. There will be no accessible capital. If Fed or ECB follow the same policy, uh, that would, the entire world would be already broke because there would be no accessible capital, especially in the times of pandemic. So again, uh, NBU are heroes for what they have achieved over the last six years. No doubt about that, absolutely. But we must move forward. Ukraine. People in Ukraine, entrepreneurs in Ukraine must have accessible capital. And it's not just about corruption. It's about, it's about policy. It's about effective NBU policy where you manage risk and reward. One thing in Ukraine is there is virtually no project finance except for BRD, I think. There is no project finance. For any, for any project, you must provide hard collaterals that are being devalued by 0 0.7, 0 0.8 uh, to the cost of the asset. And you must have very big asset base to be able to borrow uh, significantly in Ukraine. So this is another thing that has to be changed, which is in, in NBU hands, and it has nothing to do with court. Uh, Michael and Morgan, I, one question came in for John or I, I can cover it. Uh, the question was, do you invest in um, Greenfield or Brownfield? I think that question means, are you a venture? startup investor or more advanced uh, private equity investor. So from our side, from DaVinci's side, we are typically more private equity. We are sometimes the first institutional money. Sometimes we take out VC money, um, but the companies we invest in are quite stable. They have positive earnings. They have a strong revenue model. Uh, many of them are generating, um, you know, hard currency or US dollar revenue. Uh, occasionally we do take say 10 to 20% of our funds and invest into more venture. We have a number of Israeli fintech startups that we're, that we're incubating. Um, but our strategy is typically more stable companies whereby, um, you know, they are generating EBITDA. And then, you know, we look to develop them even further and, and internationalize them, as I mentioned earlier. So much more brownfield, less greenfield from our side. Yeah, it's the same for me. It's slightly differently, though. I think we, we don't, always look at stable situations. Sometimes the situations are less stable, but there's a good asset base to get involved in. So mm -hmm. I, I suppose it's a different, but similar, we're, we're more brownfield than greenfield. And that's all we got for questions so far. Okay, let's, uh, let's go back to the future then uh, uh, for the panel. What, uh, what recommendations would you have for uh, private companies that are interested in working with you, uh, what recommendations would you have for the government moving forward uh, uh, in, in those two areas? Uh, so how could uh, private companies improve their possibilities of uh, working with you? And what uh, recommendations would you have for the government moving forward uh, through the rest of 2020 and into 21? Anyone is uh, available who wants to jump in? Well, maybe <clears throat> haven't spoke for a while. Maybe I'll just pick pick it up. <clears throat> well, first of all, it's uh, 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 it's been uh, somehow on Ukrainian agenda to discuss how to attract uh, foreign capital into Ukraine, and and then we would be talking about uh, all sides of uh, 
risks and uh, and uh, mitigants to those risks and the judicial system and the corruption. And uh, I was always wondering why is that that we're not talking about the Ukrainian investor actually having the same or enjoying the same benefits of, uh, you know, um, uh, perfect legal system or at least uh, pretending to be perfect uh, uh, of uh, stab financial stability, uh, you know, governmental institutional independence and all of that. Because uh, to me, the biggest uh, problem of Ukraine is now is now uh, whether the Ukrainian investor, like you, Future, for example, Nicholas has been great explaining how they have been fighting through the bushes of uh, of, uh, of the Ukrainian, uh, you know, specific situation to actually um, invest, and they managed to make an impact, you know, on both sides. Uh, and uh, um, you know, for that reason, we see that uh, the capital is uh, is there in, uh, in in the Ukrainian hands. Uh, it's just that it has been has not been invested uh, in Ukraine as much as we would want this to be, uh, because uh, Ukrainian investor, just like uh, foreign investor, doesn't feel safe sometimes. So, from that perspective, obviously, you know what we would wish that the government would continue to do is to keep track, to keep on path with those reforms that have started, uh, you know, some five six years ago. Uh, to keep independence uh, of uh, critical uh, governmental institutions like uh, NBU and, and others, to keep, uh, uh, to keep the situation in contact and close communication with those people that Ukrainian macro stability now depends on, which is basically the monetary sponsors, uh, IMFs, and EBRD is part of that game, you know, actually um, indirectly as well. And this, these are critical partners for Ukraine to basically emerge and create a sense of uh, stability and security for any investor to, to invest. And then the foreign investors would not uh, be uh, would not be needing uh, um, a special invite. Capitalism is such a beast that you know what, whether there is a where there is a niche, an opportunity, an excessive uh, margin of benefit, uh, the investors flourish. If there is. Uh, 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 um, manageable risk on the other side. So um, from that perspective, we we would wish the government to keep uh, sight on manageable risks on behalf of those investors that would want to invest in Ukraine. Okay, any other comments from any other panelists on that area? I, I think I think it's straightforward for companies. Consistency and transparency help a lot for attracting investment. And uh, and frankly, I think it's the same for the government. So it's a it's it's not a very hard formula in the end. It's you need to have a good business idea, et cetera, et cetera. But what I find uh, challenging sometimes with with companies in emerging markets, and it's not just Ukraine, but is is the consistency of information and transparency changes. So it's obviously inconsistent. Therefore, it's hard to follow sometimes. So creating a good story with investors is uh, th these two things are critical is uh, transparency and consistency, even in difficult times. I mean, COVID is not, this COVID period is not an easy time for businesses, but it doesn't mean that the transparency and the consistency of that transparency should change because it's, it's, a, it's much stronger position to show when things are good and also when they're difficult that you get through them, I think. Jim, maybe just to add a couple of words on the, uh, what uh, Roman and uh, John just uh, said. Uh, for us, uh, transparency is key, and uh, unfortunately, what we can uh, see is that not so many, no, no, not as many as uh, they could be, not, not, not as many Ukrainian businesses are transparent enough uh, to be able to work with us. So there is a uh, significant room for improvement here. Uh, another thing uh, I think uh, Ukrainian companies uh, could start thinking of is. Uh, uh, actually, uh, succession planning. Uh, lots of Ukrainian of good Ukrainian companies uh, were established by uh, uh, patriarchs who already in their like uh, uh, 80s or 70s, and uh, there is no succession plan. Uh, I think uh, this is something that uh, can uh, unlock uh, the, the succession plan can unlock uh, actually flow of investments in, into those companies. Maybe just to add to the, both those points, you know, we look for companies and entrepreneurs who are interested in sharing risk to take a serious view on ESG. Our view on that is that it is it does actually help the value of companies over the long term. 
where they have proper governance in place, where technology, so the environmental side isn't that significant, but uh, um, governance is. And I think the companies, you know, we find a lot of our entrepreneurs that we partner with are kind of in so-called founders trap where they just don't know where to go next as far as developing their business, how to grow, how to exit, you know, how to partner. And that's where we come in and we can, you know, we can really assist um, in those work streams. So we do take active board positions and governance is certainly important. And I think, you know, the liquidity is quite scarce in Ukraine, right? So uh, we can be quite selective, but we're totally open to companies that are, that are ready to, um, you know, join that journey. Um, and again, we like to, we like to internationalize businesses, which by itself has a re-rating process embedded in that, in that, in that, um, in that development. So I um, wanted to just emphasize that ESG, ESG point. Right. Well, I would just add that uh, if Ukraine wants to attract international investors, it must create lucrative preferential conditions for businesses, especially greenfield businesses and projects in Ukraine, long term. If it wants ex existing investors, be it domestic, international, to expand, it has to do the same. If it wants to gain reputation as a place to go in the world, it must do the same. We've been talking about it for decades, but uh, I think that none of the governments have so far paid enough attention to it. We must create a gold rush to Ukraine uh, for all kind of capital. And it's easy to do. It's not a rocket science. Yeah, I agree with that. I think if you're an emerging market investor, you have to be in Ukraine. You have to have some allocation to Ukraine. Quite, quite interesting opportunities. I think that's the headline. That just has been the headline of today's panel. If you're yeah. an emerging market investor, you must be in Ukraine. That's right. Great. Okay. Uh, as we start to wrap up the panel, then let's go... Uh, to each panelist and see whatever final comments you have, uh, any ideas about the future, anything else you'd like to say before we uh, close up the day. And we want to thank all of you. It's been very informative. It's been very bottom line. It's been very real. Um, so let's just quickly, we'll start uh, with John, go around any final comments, John. Yeah, sure. Thanks, uh, Morgan, again for organizing, and thank you to the from my fellow panelists. It's been an excellent uh, conversation. I mean, look, I agree with Dennis. Uh, Ukraine is a, is a, and, and Nicholas and all of what we've been saying. It's a great place to invest, and uh, and and I think oh, there are of course limitations. You have to be careful. There are risks, all that sort of stuff. But you know, the way that that the the I feel like the way the COVID prices across uh, crisis has been handled in Kiev is a is a, is has been you know reasonably positive from what we can see from the outside. Of course, I'm in London. I haven't been for a few months, but it seems reasonably positive. And the country came into that situation with already macro room for handling it, uh, which is unlike some of its uh, um, competitor emerging markets. So we, we continue to be, to be constructive on, the, on the, the outlook for Ukraine and continue to see opportunities. So um, you know, I look forward to working with all you guys in, at some point uh, in the future. Okay, Roman, your final comments? Yes, well, uh, <clears throat> Morgan, thank you. It's been, uh, it's been a great talk. Um, well, Clearly, what can I say? Ukraine is on its way of, uh, you know, getting away from this, uh, you know, post-Soviet gastronome type of uh, environment. So we are in the way of building, a, you know, a nice shiny sh shopping center here. Uh, it's a lot of work. We're still, uh, it's still work in process. Uh, and many people find many opportunities in this work in process. Uh, and as I said, uh, when, they, um, when they find a way of managing the risks, and people on the call seem to have found, uh, you know, those ways to manage the risk, just like uh, we did. And uh, uh, we we continue believing in the country. We continue investing, and this is uh, what uh, we would like every Ukrainian investor to uh, to stick uh, to in um, in the long future. Uh, thank you very much, Andre. <laughs> Yeah, first of all, thank you, Morgan. Uh, I think that was a great discussion, and uh, thank you, fellow panelists uh, and the audience. Uh, 
yeah there is not much uh, to add from my side except maybe uh, just to state that uh, we are happy to uh, consider long-term partners be it strategics or be it uh, funds uh, we as minority investor can uh, work at both uh, we've been in ukraine like i said for over 18 years and we keep believing in the country and in, in its economy uh, and uh, we do believe that uh, there, are, there are good opportunities that uh, would enable uh, shrewd investors uh, to earn uh, really hefty returns. And yeah, we, we are open for, for a partnership. Uh, Nicholas. Yeah, well, uh, we are positive in Ukraine. We invest in Ukraine. Our CapEx program is as strong as always. At Union City, we are today building, uh, as, as I speak, 140,000 square meters of new property. We are uh, building wind farms. We are expanding biopharma. We are growing our small but very ambitious IT business. Uh, we are even conti continuing to invest in our airport, International Airport Kiev, which is the second biggest international airport in Ukraine by passenger flow, despite everything. And uh, my message to anyone looking at investment is that money costs nothing today. Inflation is just around the corner. Invest in real assets. And if you want real returns, go to developing markets and go to Ukraine. And I'm very excited to see all my fellow panelists who have invested in Ukraine, have succeeded and in investing. Thank you to all and each of you as, as a Ukrainian. I'm truly uh, excited to see you and hear you, your stories about Ukraine. Hope that our cross pass cross and that you and all of us continue to invest in this beautiful country. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Always great to work with you. Uh, uh, now let's go back to London, uh, one of the, the financial headquarters of the world. Dennis. Okay. Thank you, Morgan and uh, fellow panelists. I'm actually from New York, but uh, very, very excited about okay. investing in Ukraine. Um, so, yeah. So I think just to repeat, you know, part of my opening comments, we're, we're quite excited about deploying capital in Ukraine. Uh, we see great opportunities. We see very smart people. We see very um, you know, we see, we, see, we think the country has much, much more capacity. Um, and so we also are excited about developing our brand, hiring people and having Da Vinci more of a known, reliable private equity financing partner in, in Ukraine. Um, we would love to see the local capital markets develop even more. Um, we would like to invest into, um, you know, into the exchanges and into, into different um, infrastructure around finance that could help fuel uh, liquidity and local capital markets as well. So we're not just looking to go in and make money and get out. We really do want to help develop the company and uh, and, and, and our track record, I think, um, you know, supports our capabilities doing that. So, um, you know, so we'll be active. You'll be hearing more and more from us. Um, we think it's uh, an underinvested market and uh, we'd like to take, uh, uh, we'd like to, to, to make Ukraine's first unicorn. Um, um, and, um, so it was a great, great uh, discussion. Uh, thank everyone on the panel and Morgan, everyone for organizing. Thank you very much. Uh, this has been very encouraging today. It's very uplifting. We uh, like to have good news. It's great that all of you are, uh, have said you're, you're still in the game. You're playing the game. You want to play the game in the future. You are managing investments. You are working on new investments. Uh, you're optimistic about the ability to find reliable partners, reliable investors to work with you uh, to invest in Ukraine. So we hear way too much uh, negative news about Ukraine and much of the business news is, gets covered up and the positive news that we've heard here from today. We've had at least now 15 or 18 investors on our programs. They're all staying involved in Ukraine. They all have investments there that they're managing today. And this is all good news for the future. So uh, John, thank you again for helping put this together. We want to stay in touch with all of you uh, in the future. Uh, be looking for more webinars. Uh, uh, we're going to have a couple more in, uh, in August, particularly about the Independence Day of Ukraine coming up on the 24th, number 29. 
moving forward to number 30. And we'll get back in touch with you because, uh, again, we want to focus on real deals with real people who do real things and make real investments. So thank you, ever, Thank you. And thank for all those who are listening. And uh, goodbye from the U.S.-Ukraine Business Council. We'll all see you on the next webinar. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thanks, Thanks Thank everyone. You. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. Bye. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you, guys. Bye -bye. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. You.